The title of this presentation is Who is this God that I should listen to? But before I continue, I would like to uh, mention just for clarification. In my presentations, I'm using YHVH and pronounce it as Yahua. The Hebrew letters are yod heh vav -Heh, instead of Lord in capital letters, which is a title and not a name. And I'm using Yahusha instead of Jesus, which is not a translation, but a transliteration and really has no meaning whatsoever neither in Hebrew nor in English. Yahuwah and Yahusha are the actual original names and the true nature and character of them. Now let's go back to our presentation and the title, Who is this Elohim? Who is this God that I should listen to? In Psalm 90, verse 2, it states, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art Elohim. Question again, who is this Elohim? Who, when asked to identify himself, says, Aya, Asha Aya, meaning I am that I am. Moses does not believe the names Elohim, Adonai, Elohim, and the Elohim of your ancestors, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob are convincing enough. He wants something much more explicit. So Moses desires a name that spells out the exact nature of this Elohim who wants to redeem them. It is wonderful to see both at the beginning of his career and later when Moses faces the frustration of leading the Jewish people through the desert that he persists in seeking even greater intimacy with Elohim to give him the confidence to proceed with his mission. In Exodus 3, 13 to 14, it says, And Moses said unto Elohim, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them the Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you and they shall say to me what is his name what shall I say unto them and Elohim said unto Moses Aya Asha Aya I am that I am and he said thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel I am has sent me unto you Elohim presents him with a wonderfully enigmatic name, Aya Asha Aya. We can personally know Yahuwah, he who created the universe in all of its magnitude and creative details, is able to be known by us. We are privileged and encouraged to know him intimately. For Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24 states, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahuwah, who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares 
ya huwa. Yahuwah is approachable. He invites us to talk to him and engage him in whatever concerns us. We don't have to get our act together first. Neither do we need to be theologically correct. It is his nature to be loving and accepting when we go to him seriously. Psalms 145.18 Yahuwah is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Yahuwah creates. Everything we make is put together with existing materials or built on previous thoughts. Yahuwah has a capacity of speaking things into existing not just galaxies and life forms, but solutions to today's problems. Adonai is creative for us. His power is something he wants us to be aware of and to rely on. Psalms 147.5 says, Great is our Yahuwah, and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Psalms 121, 1 and 2. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Yahuwah, the maker of heaven and earth. Yahuwah is forgiving. We sin, we tend to do things our way instead of his way, and he sees it and knows it. Yah does not merely overlook such sin, but is prepared to judge and condemn people for their sin. However, He is forgiving and will forgive us from the moment we begin a relationship with Him. Yahusha, the son of Yahuwah, paid for our sin with His death on the cross. He rose from the dead and offered us His forgiveness. Romans 3, 22-25 says, We are made right in Elohim's sight when we trust in Yahusha HaMashiach to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in the same way. No matter who we are or what we have done, we are made right with Elohim when we believe that Yahusha shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. Yahuwah is honest. Just like a person who lets you know their thoughts and feelings, Elohim clearly tells us about himself, the possible difference being. He is always honest. Everything he says about himself or about us is reliable information. Truer than our feelings, thoughts and perception, Elohim is totally accurate and honest in what he says. Every promise he makes to us can be fully counted on. He means it. We can take him at his word. In Psalms 119, 130 and 105, it says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Your word is a lamb to my feet and the light to my path. Yahuwah is able. How would you like to be always 100% right about everything? Yahuwah is. His wisdom is unlimited. He understands all the elements of a situation, including the history and future events related to it. We do not have to update him, counsel him, or persuade him to do the right thing. He will, because he is able, he is capable, and his motives are pure. If we trust him, he will never make a mistake, never undercut us 
or deceive us. He can be fully trusted to do what is right in all circumstances at all times. In Psalms 25.3, it says, No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. What a promise. Or in Psalms 9.10, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Yahuwah, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. What hope and encouragement for those who have faith in this great Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahuwah Elohim. The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. Name above all names, worthy of our praise, my heart will sing, how great is our Elohim. That's by Chris Tomlin. Yahuwah's greatness is unsearchable and incomprehensible by our finite minds. Yahuwah is limitless. In all he knows, we call that omniscience. There is nothing that he doesn't already know. He knows the answer to every question we should ask. He even knows the questions we should have asked when we didn't ask anything. Yahuwah is measureless. In all he does, we call this omnipotence. There is nothing that he cannot do. He is not limited in his ability in any aspect. He has never gotten better because he has always been as good as he can get. Yahuwah's greatness is untouchable. He is awesome because he is holy and eternal. He is without the element of corruption. He will never tire, never faint, never falter, never fail. He never had a beginning, and he will never see an end. That is our Creator. That's our Savior. How encouraging that we can trust Him, believe Him, and follow Him. Yahuwah's greatness is unmatchable, priceless. Who but Yahuwah could beautifully design his creation and could spread out the enormity of space? Who but him could set in motion the events of your life? Who but him would love sinners so much to send his only son? In this PowerPoint presentation, there are two essential points that I want to communicate. The first is the concept of knowing Adonai, of knowing our Heavenly Father, which leads to listening to Him. And the second concept is an important aspect of how one is to identify the will and the voice of Elohim. In the book of Exodus, we find the familiar exhortation given by Moses to Pharaoh. He said, let my people go. To this command, Pharaoh asked a very good question. And if we haven't already done so, this is the question we must ask ourselves. We read in Exodus 5, 2, 
And Pharaoh said, Who is Jehovah, that I should hearken unto his voice, to let Israel go? I know not Jehovah, or Yahuwah, and moreover I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh had many Elohims, many gods. Why listen to this one? In our day, people have many mighty ones, many gods, many false gods in their lives that contend with the Elohim of Israel and its voice. To Pharaoh, the very idea of obeying a Elohim he had never seen, a Elohim of slowly slaves, of shepherd stock, was ludicrous. And this Moses was not a very convincing speaker either. What does a leader of sheep know about leading men? And his brother Aaron is only a slave and the son of a slave. Neither Moses nor Aaron possess any quality that would impress Pharaoh. At least this may have been his thoughts. So, how can a Elohim, who would send a shepherd fugitive and a slave to deliver his warning, be revered by the powerful Pharaoh? He was the mightiest man on earth at that time. Just as Pharaoh had many Elohims with different names, so too today people have many mighty ones, many gods, many false gods, many idols that are known by device by diverse names. You may know a few of them personally. I will name just a few, like materialism, television, sports, video games, politics, pornography, anger, drugs, and finally, oneself. This question of who is Yahuwah that I should listen to his voice goes straight to the care of Deuteronomy, to the core of Deuteronomy 6.4, and that's from the Restoration Bible. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah is our Elohim, Yahuwah alone. Moses had recently just discovered the Elohim of Israel personally and was proclaiming this one and only Elohim to the skeptical Pharaoh. This Pharaoh would soon learn the fear of Elohim and would soon know that there is no Elohim like the Elohim of Israel. For those who have personally encountered the awesome power of Yahuwah in their life, such a one understands what it means to proclaim. Who is like you, Yahuwah, among the Elohims? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? That's from Exodus 15.11. For those who know the Elohim of Israel and have experienced his glorious holiness in their lives and have developed a healthy awe for him, such people understand the praise and obedience to do him and understand that there is none else to whom we owe our obedience to. It won't matter how powerful something is in our life. It won't matter because the fear of Yahuwah will outweigh any other outside influence in our life. It will govern every decision we make and every action we take. If we skipped this first wisdom in our walk with Him and we truly want to know Him, we should pray that He instills it in us. He who truly knows the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob understands who he is 
and knows why they should listen to his voice, as opposed to the other mighty ones, to the other no-gods, the false gods in this world. As Pharaoh makes a statement in question, we see that he was about to get schooled to the divine school. In a relatively short period of time, Pharaoh would learn very serious lessons, what it takes some their whole lifetime to learn. He would learn the essence of the words in Deuteronomy 6.4 and that there is nothing else to fear besides Yahuwah Elohim, the only true and living Elohim, the Elohim of Israel. There are many who do not know Yahuwah and thus don't listen to his voice. Some are self-proclaimed unbelievers, some call themselves Christians, and some call themselves Messianic. But it doesn't matter what you call yourself. Knowing the Father is directly connected to obeying his voice. This is evidence in the second part of Pharaoh's response, as we see in Exodus 5.2. The result of not knowing Yahuwah is disobedience. Pharaoh states, I know not Yahuwah, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Like Pharaoh, are there areas in your life where your heart is hardened against the Elohim of Israel? and his will, will he in his love have to chasten you so that you repent? Believe it or not, the plagues of Egypt were actually a sign of Elohim's love for the nation of Egypt. In Hebrews 12, 5-7, we read, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the, ch the chastening of Yahuwah, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom Yahuwah loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. If ye endure chastening, Elohim dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Did we ever consider that one of the reasons that Yahuwah gave Egypt ten plagues was that he was giving them ten chances to repent out of love for them? Elohim could have just destroyed them with any one of the plagues, and many of them did repent. Many of them found refuge in the house marked with the blood of the Lamb. Indeed, a mixed multitude joined Israel in the exodus from Egypt. Yahuwah punishes sinners, not necessarily through external punishment, but by letting the awful consequences of their own bad lifestyle show them the error of their ways. He even did this with Israel after the exodus. In Psalm 81, 11 to 14, the author describes Elohim saying, How my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would have none of me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels, or that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Skeptics should know that Yahuwah Elohim will punish us by letting us engage in our foolish sins, but as soon as we desire to repent, He will deliver us from our sins. He allowed Pharaoh to wallow in his foolish disobedience. Elohim was not the primary cause of that disobedience and would have allowed Pharaoh to repent if, if Pharaoh had chosen to do that. 
Pharaoh's failure to do that and not release the Israelites says more about his character than Yahuwah's. Pharaoh had his chance to peacefully release the Israelites, but he ignored Yahuwah's warnings and hardened his heart. This description of events preserves Elohim's sovereignty. Yahuwah is not thwarted by Pharaoh's obstinacy, but has providentially foreseen it and uses it for the good of his people. As a consequence of Pharaoh's own actions, Elohim allowed Pharaoh's heart to reach its maximum level of stubbornness, and Israel's freedom was purchased at a heavy price for the Egyptians. It took ten plagues for Pharaoh to get to know Yahuwah and to submit to him, at least for a while. Many Egyptians, including Pharaoh, rejected the instruction of Yahuwah. Disobedience to Elohim's instruction put us in a dangerous position. Never forget that. When we neglect one of the precepts found in Torah, is his instruction, we are not simply transgressing Torah. No, we are denying the one who gave us the precepts, and they were given for our protection, for our blessing. Indeed, we are denying the dominion of Yahuwah in our life when we neglect his precepts and instructions, because they are given for our good, for our salvation. And when we keep his precepts, we are accepting him and his dominion in our life. After all, remember that every breath comes from our Heavenly Father. We live because he allows us to live. So let's praise him, honor him, and follow his instructions. The ten plagues spoken of in the book of Exodus are greatly magnified when we compare them to the future plagues found in the book of Revelation. The purpose of these plagues are the same to judge the false gods, the false Elohims of this world. As mentioned before, the people of Egypt had many gods they served and worshipped and that governed different aspects of their life and their environment. But they were false. They were created by men. In the future, Yahuwah pours out his plagues upon the earth. He will be judging these false gods, these false Elohim of this world that people have given themselves over to instead of given themselves to the one and only two Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Elohim of Israel, to serve and to walk in his commandments, statutes, and judgments. There are a lot of people today that identify themselves as believers in Messiah, but neither know him or the Elohim of Israel. In Matthew 7, 21-23, our Master Yahushua states, Not everyone who says to me, Adonai, Adonai, or Master, Master, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, many will say to me, Master, Master, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, if you got up in the middle of many churches in America today and proclaimed the message that our rabbi did in the passage, we just read, we just were reading, I would probably be cast out and be labeled a legalist. What message would I be cast out for? The message that proclaims, only those who do what my Father in heaven wants will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And I certainly would be silenced for later qualifying the statement by saying that those who make it a habit, those who intentionally make it a lifestyle to break Elohim's law, meaning his Torah, are those who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I have no doubt that I would be thrown out of many churches if I taught this, but I would not be thrown out because I was speaking of my own accord, for these are indeed Messiah Yahusha's own words. These words of Messiah are somewhat of a paradox. We are not saved by our works, but those who are saved will have a company in works. Many of whom proclaim the name of Yahusha will be completely shocked at the second coming when they find themselves pleading the Messiah for salvation and he turns them away. And it will be because they accepted the lie because they accepted a false teacher and a false prophet. In John 10, 27, Yahusha states, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In John 18, 37, we read, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king? Then... Yahusha answered, You say that I am a king? For this reason I have been born, and for this reason I have come into the world, that I should testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The question is, what is this truth that Messiah Yahusha speaks of here? Scripture has the answer for us. In Psalms 119, 142, we read, Your righteousness is an eternal righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. What is the litmus test to make sure that we are not actually walking in the footsteps of Pharaoh instead of the footsteps of Messiah? Again, Scripture has the answer for us. In 1 John 2, 3 to 6, it states, The way we can be sure we know him is if we are obeying his commands. Anyone who says, I know him, but isn't obeying his commands, is a liar. The truth is not in him. But if someone keeps doing what he says, then truly love for Elohim has been brought to its goal in him. This is how we are sure that we are united with him. A person who claims to be continuing in union with him ought to conduct his life the way he did. In Peter 1, or in 1 Peter, believers in Messiah, Yahusha, are described as a royal priesthood. In 1 Peter 2, 7-12, it states, now to you who keep trusting, he's precious. But to those who are not trusting, the very stones that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Although he is a stone that will make people stumble, a rock over which they will trip. They are stumbling at the word, disobeying it as had been planned. But you are a chosen generation, a chosen people, the king's priest, a holy nation, a people for Elohim to possess. Why? In order for you to declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness in this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are Elohim's people. Before you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and temporary residents not to give in to the desires of your old nature which keep warring against you. But to live such good lives among the pagans that even though they know 
now speak against you as evil doeth, they will, as a result of seeing your good actions, give glory to Elohim on the day of his coming. Is this language of being a holy priesthood, a set apart priesthood, unique to the writings we find in 1 Peter? Or do we find its original context in the Torah? In Exodus 19, 3 to 6, we read the context of being a set apart priesthood and those who have been delivered through the blood of the Passover lamb are those who listen to the voice of the Elohim of Israel. Exodus 19, 3 to 6 And Moses went up unto Elohim, and Yahuwah called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar people, a peculiar pressure, a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 320, Messiah Yahushua states, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Will you join the disciples, the holy ones, the saints of Elohim, in the end of days, for the marriage feast of the Lamb? Will you be one of the comparably few that hear his voice and open the door to his dominion in your life? Will you indeed allow his, this Jewish rabbi into you and allow him to live his life through you? Are you afraid what people will think when people start seeing how much you are starting to sound and look like this Jewish rabbi? And how much less people start seeing the one they knew and were comfortable with? If today you hear his voice, listen to the words found in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, 1 to 5. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich to the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and Elohim has remembered her iniquities. But even though we love our Master and find pride in serving him, let us be circumspect to keep a true servant's heart about us and not become puffed up. In Luke 17, verse 7 to 10, our master Yahusha taught us thus, But who is there among you, having a servant plowing or keeping sheep, that will say when he comes in from the field, Come immediately and sit down at the table, 
and will not rather tell him, prepare my supper, clothe yourself properly, and serve me while I eat and drink? Afterward you shall eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded? I think not. Even so also you, when you have done all the things that are commanded you, say, we are unworthy, meaning unprofitable servants. We have done our duty. We have done what was our duty to do. There are many voices in this world. How are we to know which is from Yahuwah? We have to be careful not to confuse our own passions or what we see as right in our own eyes as the voice of Yahuwah. The coming of the anti-Messiah will be characterized by many mighty works and wonders and will move people as he speaks great swelling words. Now the question, how will you avoid the deception? Like Satan to Yahusha, the anti-Messiah will likely even quote scripture or twist scripture to deceive those who claim to have faith, yet are misled by their own personal carnal passions. The scripture says that the deception will be so great that it would become close to even deceiving the very elect. Now at this point I would like to uh, point you to a PowerPoint presentation that I made recently with the title The Ultimate Deception. My friends, this deceiver is already here. And it's a, it is a Christian Greek Messiah. I encourage you to watch that because we all have been deceived at one time. In Matthew 24, 24, we read where our Master Yahusha teaches us. For what? False messiahs and false prophets will rise up. And they will give great signs and wonders so as to lead astray if possible, even the elect. So if someone comes forth or comes to somebody and claims to have received a message from heaven, this doesn't automatically mean that his voice or message should be accepted and or obeyed, even if accompanied by signs of wonders. We must discern the spirits. Any message from heaven cannot contradict what already had been revealed in Scripture, starting in Genesis 1 1. Don't believe everything you hear, test it for scriptural validity first. In 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And remember also, as I had mentioned in the beginning, even our Bibles were changed and corrupted by evil men inspired by Satan, just by taking out the name of our Heavenly Father, and replacing it with a title, L-O-R-D, which is just another word for Baal. The word of Yahuwah has already been clearly given to us and is not far away from us that we have to seek some heavenly voice to know his will. The word of Yahuwah, his Torah, has clearly been given to us to discern what is good and that which is evil, to discern which is righteous and which is sin. It is by these words that we are to test the spirits, and by these words alone 
that we are to test any would-be prophet or teacher, even if a voice from heaven issues for us to supposedly clarify something for us, or somebody receives a word from heaven to teach us something, we must reject it if it is not in accordance with the already written Torah of Israel's Elohim. The truth alone will set us free from a multitude of bad doctrines, many of which are indeed from demonic voices. Adonai's character is revealed in his Torah, and he doesn't change. He is eternal and is the eternal one. He makes it very plain in scripture. And that is who he is, and we should listen to his voice and his voice alone. His will has already been revealed to us, and by this his sheep hear his voice. If we test all things by his Torah and have it written on our heart, when he does speak, we will recognize immediately and we will not respond to a foreign, strange master. Listening to Yahuwah's voice is described as obedience in the scripture and not as legalism. Ideally, as you grow in maturity, you will listen to its voice out of a passionate love for the Elohim of eternity. To listen in scripture always means to submit, to do. It means to be open to or to be receptive. The Greek word is the same root as the one for obedience. It means to be receptive. Here again the question of Pharaoh, and who is this Elohim that I should listen to and obey? Let's remember, Pharaoh's refusal to obey Yahuwah comes from his arrogance, and his arrogance came from his ignorance. By the way, one can often find the same thing today as the source of the problem when men and women live in rebellion against the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the sake of those who would honestly like to have Pharaoh's question, Who is Yahuwah that I should obey his voice? Answered, let's provide some answers. Yahuwah the Elohim of Israel reveals himself to be the creator of heaven and earth. As the one true Elohim, he is an infinite, eternal, and morally perfect personal deity. He was, he is, and he will be. And according to Romans 14.11, he states, As I live, says Yahuwah, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to Elohim. Then there is Isaiah 45.23 from the New American Standard Bible. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. However, my friends, at that time, it will be too late. Why not turn to him at this point, right now, while the door of mercy is still open? Repent of your sins, confess Yahusha HaMashiach, and be baptized in his name.
because there will come a time when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of Yahuwah Elohim and to his son Yahusha Hamashiach. One day every tongue will confess. You are Yahuwah Elohim, the true Elohim. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now, at this point, today, at this very moment. Please give us a thumbs up if you agree with this message. Shalom. The Supreme Provider is Yahusha HaMashiach. This presentation was prepared and narrated by myself. You can contact me at malachi4.4 at regan.com. Some information for this PowerPoint presentation was taken from various other sources and from my own research.